Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so sustainable design, practice within fashion design, um, practice uh, fashion design with a purpose. It's, um, it's actually added another whole dimension onto students' work, um, thinking that they've got to really, really, that challenge of thinking about how they can be more sustainable with the, the types of yarns they're using, the types of fabrics they're using, the dyes, the way they construct the garment, the, the pattern cutting, zero waste pattern cutting and so on. Um, so it is, it's added a whole new dimension to design really. Um, so this is the Keeling tartan here, and this symbolizes climate change. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, I just thought I'd put that on at the beginning to show you. Um, it's a UN United Nations um, registered uh, tartan. So if you think, um, what can you do as a designer to highlight climate change? How can we reduce the environmental impact of fashion and textiles? What materials and yarns could you work with? What methods of garment construction could you adopt? And how can your collections communicate with a wider audience? Now that could be collections or it could be product or whatever it is that you're, you're designing and making. So I couldn't really talk about climate change without talking about the Fashion from Nature exhibition. I might have mentioned this before, but it, it was such a great exhibition. Um, it was a thought provoking exhibition and it, um, the, the V&A's always do a thought provoking exhibitions, to be honest. Um, and it really was inspirational for designers, forming new trends, a wider audience, uh, a very significant exhibition. It was very important an eye opening display determined to incite change. The exhibition inspired us to think about the sourcing of our clothing and the environmental footprint our fashion choices have. It inspired people to be more sustainably conscious and school and university students are now embedding sustainability into their work and plastic pollution is now a topic of conversation. Greta Thunberg's environmental activism and Stacey Dooley's Blood, Sweat and T-shirt television documentary followed in the path of this big exhibition. And I did really physically notice um, a whole new conversation starting after this exhibition um, about climate change. I know we've been talking about it since the 1970s, but there seems to there definitely is a, a new current trend for it uh, and to talk about it and to find new ways of, of working. And so I just, I thought I had to put Greta Thunberg in there, the Swedish designer who skipped school and inspired an international movement to fight climate change. I'm sure you've all heard of her. Um, so the, the exhibition, uh, it explored um, nature um, and, and fashion practices for, the, for 400 years. Um, and touched on everything from feathers, whalebone, mother of pearl and dye production, which were all examined. And downstairs, um, it was very much about taking from fashion, the Victorians and how they took everything, you know, even beetles wings, everything from fashion. And then upstairs, there was the, ex there was the exhibition part, which was giving back to fashion. Um, and I think, oh no, it's not on, yeah. So, yeah, so upstairs there were, uh, in fact, I have got some more slides a bit further on with, with showing that, I think. But uh, yeah, it was it was really looking at how we can work in a in a better way, in a more sustainable, more more um, responsible way uh, and more current designers. So it was a real contrast between the Victorians and how we are now. Uh, really good to see. Um, the exhibition opened to coincide with the Fashion Revolution Week and just days before the five year anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster. So the Rana Plaza disaster was in April 2013 at the Darker Garments factory, um, which collapsed in Bangladesh. Um, the structured failure of eight, an eight storey commercial uh, building called Rana Plaza um, in, and the search for the dead ended on the on in May, so it took like like a month to find everybody. 
The death toll was 1,134 apparently, and approximately 2,500 injured people were rescued alive. So imagine how many people were working in this place. It was considered the deadliest garment factory disaster in history. So it really did shake the world to think of people being take, being really taken for granted and working for nothing as well and working in really bad conditions. Um, so how can we reduce the environmental impact of fashion textiles? I mean, that, that top picture there looks like Primark to me. I've seen the, going in, I've been in shops when it's looked like that, when everything's all over the floor, nothing really matters, nothing really costs a lot. You know, everything's cheap. Um, you know, there's no sort of respect for the clothes. Uh, and just people are just buying, buying, buying and then throwing away. And then we don't know where to put it afterwards. And that bottom picture just shows that there isn't anybody to give it to anymore because nobody wants the stuff that we've got that we want to get rid of. And clothes have been getting cheaper and fast fashion means that we're buying more and more, growing concerns about poor working conditions and pay in clothing factories, textile and clothing production pollutes the environment and contributes to the greenhouse effect and climate change. So the UK is facing a crisis in disposing waste. Here's the other images. So these are the images, the other images from the um, exhibition. Um, you've got uh, Katie Jones there with her crocheted pants, trousers, um, and those were made from surplus yarn. And then the Greenpeace slogan t-shirt there, there was a lot of slogan t-shirts from the 70s and 80s um you know saying so it's been we've been talking about it for a long time about climate change and uh there were some lovely things actually from Vivian Westwood as well more slightly more current or no maybe there weren't maybe there were 70s and 80s as well more about climate change and or make do and mend and all of that or buy less buy less or what was it where where less buy more oh no buy more so buy less wear longer or whatever you know those sort of slogan things that have come out that are really really good to get out there now those slogans um so yes yeah, sustainability trend um yeah also actually within uh within the exhibition there was also um highlighted uh nature and the aesthetics of nature uh, the textures, the patterns, um, and how it influenced designers for wallpaper and home furnishings and fashion fashion as well, of course. But that's also, it wasn't just about fashion. Um, but, and also, you know, so and it also highlighted that design decisions can make, can have an 80% impact on sustainability. Design can be made from sustainable sources. The fashion industry should be working in an ethical way in terms of pay and working conditions. And change is emerging on slow fashion, lifetime guarantee and recycled schemes. Um, beautiful fashion shouldn't cost the earth, but it is emerging, but it's very small businesses that are, are building up uh, small ethical ways of working. It still is very long way off getting to the to the mainstream, though I'm afraid. So, this um, yeah, this also highlighted plastic pollution. The last straw campaign. This is all about um, removing access to plastic straws. Um, many bars and restaurants are joining the global movement to reduce plastic drinking straws from our landfills, streams, oceans, and beaches. 500 million straws are used and discarded every day in the United States alone. And they're used for an average of 20 minutes, but their effect lasts a lifetime. So then you also have, you have then the problem before where, before we were using plastic straws and then we were using up too many trees. So then we started using plastic straws oh, and then yeah. it wouldn't waste. So and now we're going back to normal straws and then we're gonna have the problem again of well, chopping paper down straws. too many poor trees. I know. Well, <laughs> do. I don't know. I don't know. But at least straws. paper straws can can recycle, whereas plastic doesn't, does it? So much. No, I agree. I agree. I'm just saying yeah. there's another problem that will come out from yeah. it, probably. Yeah. But it's extreme waste for a minimum of convenience. Like all that waste just for like a quick 20 minute suck on a straw. You know, mental, isn't it? Really. Yeah. But you are right. There's, you know, what can you do? Um, Another one here showing the oceans and how disgusting that looks, not very nice. Um, and of course the sea, 
the ocean uh, mammals and animals and fish are all suffering too, eating plastic and so on and, and uh, suffocating. Um, this was interesting, uh, um, something that came about from after that exhibition, um, the Plastic Pollution Project was set up. Um, and it was in collaboration with the V&A. Well, I started that at the V&A Museum uh, and then brought it to the uh, Saturday Club at the University of Brighton uh, and got Tom Meads to come in and join. And he's a graduate from Brighton University. Uh, and he came in and joined because he's actually an award winning product designer uh, that works with recycled plastics that um, he makes speakers. So it's all about product and uh, he squashes all the plastic and makes really sort of, um, uh, well, yeah, speakers is his main thing at the moment, but I'm sure there's some other products as well. But, you know, uh, sorry, but with milk bottles, the plastic on it, you can put it in like a toasty machine and something like that, and you can melt it and then put it in a mould and you can make things like bowls and pens with them. Oh, fantastic. I won't button again, but it's a really good idea if you're using no, it. No, do button it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, really brilliant. I mean, you know, it was lovely to see the young students starting to play with plastic and, and you know, all the stuff that would normally be thrown in the bin or just like lost somewhere was actually starting, you know, OK, we still got it and it still needs to be thrown away, I suppose, at the end. But in the meantime, they're making beautiful bits of art and bits of plastic and bits of fashion or something. And it's highlighting the cause. So hopefully they're thinking about it more now by having done this and then they'll take it to their parents. Their parents might think about it more. So, you know, it's, it's getting that conversation out there. Every little bit of it can help. Um, so, yeah, the National Saturday Club. What have I put here? Plastic pollution works in museums and school workshops. Yeah, in museums and schools, layering, netting, weaving, stitching, tying, knotting, using grids. So really being creative. So you can be totally creative with with, um, you know, with with waste products. I mean, actually, even just since we've been in lockdown, um, my students, the degree students and final year students last year, when we went, first went into lockdown in March, they were all having to work with uh, materials they could find from home just to make their degree clothes, their degree collections in the end, because, uh, and doing a lot more online as well, a lot more uh, digital fashion shows came about and little uh, films and so on, but they still had to make products, you know, so they still had to use what they could find. Lots of very innovative textiles came out of that year group. Anyway, <clears throat> coming back to this uh, Keeling Tartan, this is another project really, the Rebel Tartan project. Um, the Liberation Kilt Company has designed a range of tartans symbolising contemporary social movements. So like, for instance, climate change, human trafficking and nuclear disarmament. The purpose of the Rebel Tartan Project is to explore the various textiles and fashion design possibilities for the Keeling Tartan. And this project has been delivered to universities nationally for the past five years and internationally for two years. Um, and we're running it now at the moment with um, Glasgow School of Art, Dundee, Dundee University, Manchester, Nottingham, and what's the other one? Bunker in uh, Japan. Um, yeah, so it's it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's a, a really good project. Everybody works on it at their own pace and at their own time, and they come out with some fantastic. Um, some fun they do a lot of great research and then come out with some fantastic outcomes at the end whether it be textiles or product or whatever it is that they're doing and you know and it really really does highlight the plight basically highlights climate change um oh well i've written some of it here so yeah and actually the the the, the tartan itself it symbolizes the wholesale shift in the energy basis of civilization from fossil fuels, grey and black track to the 100% clean, clean energy in the green and yellow track. So the, the colours mean something. And it's named in honour of the late Charles David Keeling of the Scripps Institution of Oceanog Oceanography. <laughs> Oceanography. Oceanography. I can't pronounce. I don't know. <laughs> David knows. <laughs> I don't know. 
whose measurements from 1958 onwards supplied the first concrete evidence of rapidly increasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, commonly known as the Keeling Curve. So you could look that up. Um, but anyway, uh, the United Nations have, um, they've licensed it or they've, um, they've taken it on as their, their actual, uh, they patent it, patented it patent and registered it sorry they've registered it as their their um their tartan for climate change which is really great so we're working with that company and with the united nations to look at um to to and the universities to develop that project so when you think also it's not just about the materials you use or highlighting the the cause it's also thinking about the the product itself and the 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 um, construction of the garments and quite often we I work with students with geometrics just with geometrics I get them to work with pattern cutting and pattern cutting in a way that is transferable so it can be for for product or architecture or anything you know it's about making shapes and I quite often look back at um, Max Tilk um, who plays with geometrics his his book is all about the original uh, national costumes, uh, all the European and Tur Turkish and um, I don't know, all just all the original beautiful costumes that all sort of come from kimonos. There's some Chinese ones in there too. Uh, uh, everything, really, really beautiful work. And the, the slides in the book, there is a book and the slides are really, really original, old, beautiful slides of drawings from those times. But about them is that everything is very much made from rectangles or squares. And if it's a triangle, it's come from a square. So it's, yeah, squares, rectangles and triangles, and they are really gorgeous designs. And the leading textile um, designers, the leading uh, zero waste designers today are very much looking back at this to get inspiration to do some very current designs. But it's just, you don't have to, when you look at these designs, they're very, obviously very of, a, of a, an aesthetic of a national costume, but you can do things to them. You can change them and you can actually do things to make them much more current. Um, you know, we've looked at and explored things like fabric manipulation, like pleating and tucking and laddering and depending on what fabrics you're using, mixing multiples and so on in inserts and things like that. And depending on what fabrics you use as well can make a total difference. So some of the zero waste patterns there, that is a max tilt pattern for a pair of trousers. It's just a rectangle there. And as you can see, the first picture, you cut off the triangle and put it back on upside down. And suddenly you've got the shape of a pair of trousers with sort of, you know, the outside leg on the fold. So it's very, very simple starting points. And you see the bodice there with the back and the two fronts, then a bit of a sleeve at the side. You can see how it could fold over in the middle where the shoulders are to give you uh, a, a top. So they're very simple starting points. This is uh, from a student at um, University of Brighton. I think this is about 2012, actually, um, working initially with zero waste again, but thinking about what is the square? What can you do with a square? So the first square one, you cut that little bit off and these left with the bit underneath. So I don't know if you can see my cursor. So he's got the first square, cuts this bit off, then he's got this bit. So obviously that bit has to come back on somewhere, like that will be used somewhere in there as maybe um, a facing or something. So he's left with this, then he mirror images it. So he's got some sort of a body here and two arms. Um, and then he does another version, but with shorter arms, shorter sleeves. Then he turns it round and mirror images it again. So it's all this sort of mirror imaging repetition, mirror imaging again and so on. And it's really interesting. Um, obviously, it's a, a very it came out of very androgynous clothing that was quite loose fitting, but very, very it definitely had taken away. It wasn't a, a max tilt looking thing, but it was on. But it was definitely inspired by that. This is David Tell for another student as well. Um, so this is actually before 2012. This is the earlier. Matt, David Telfer is now one of the leading zero waste designers out there. Uh, just below sort of Timo Risnan and Holly McQuillan, I'd say. Um, 
but um you know you can see here how something can be made what well, it is there you've got a strip there of fabric and it's very this reminds me of izimiyaki completely apoc designs but it's all done from one piece of fabric so you slash through here you slash through here you slash in there so it's just slashing into the fabric obviously you have to cut it off so you've got one strip of fabric and you've got two tops so if this one because here you sort of what are you doing here you're folding over that you're folding over the the sleeves you're going to eventually bend this in on both sides so you get that and then this becomes the um this becomes the hood so you've got that that's the other way around so okay it's folded up as well so you've got this very deep um hem or it could even be stitched into as pockets and so on which i think it probably is because if you look when this is folded forward you know there is obviously some slits there and you've got pockets because this has been brought up so high so just from one piece of fabric like that you've ended up with something like this very nice very easy very nice another one as well is working with tubes so very similar to that one just tubes and cuts so if this is a tube you've got two tops here um the first one you just slash into the slash in here which opens out this you've got a hole here um and then you fold this over and there you have you've got your neck comes out here your arms come out here and it becomes a top you know you can squash that back and this is the other side however i think to to make this better i think that should be a slash too and that so if you had a slash 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 i think that would have been even easier uh, even nicer um because you're taking a hole out there so you've got to use that circle of fabric somewhere and it could quite easily just be a slash to put your head through so what is sustainability then um it's got three interwoven and connected elements so you've got your social your environment and your economic um there's no point having one without the other basically because the economic it's got to make money and this is it, it has to make money in order to pay this the industry pay the people um and also to enable an um an, uh, a better environment um so how does textile and fashion industry impact on the environmental contribute uh, and contribute to global warming the environmental how does the textile fashion industry impact on the environment and contribute to global warming well i mean you know we've got at the moment what i mean it, it really is fashion the fashion industry um is one of the biggest um uh the biggest contributors to um oh it's um i'm thinking of the gases um what is it the uh oh it's gone gone the um oh Oh, no, it's gone. Greenhouse. The gases. Greenhouse. What am I thinking? Greenhouse. Greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, with all the dyes and all, there's all that stuff about in India, was it, when they were shoving dyes into the rivers and into the waters, you know. Um, you know, it's all sorts of stuff, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, and then obviously we've got, you know, this, everyone's got to be paid. Set, I mean, just even when we went into lockdown just recently, wasn't there a big scandal in Leicester? about all the um, workers were in the factories and they were working at less than uh, the national, less than the uh, going rate. And, um, and they were also furloughed, but they were told to come in and work. Absolutely disgusting. So they were furloughed and still working. It's just awful. So, you know, there's a lot needs to be changed within our factories for definite. And then the economic, the thing is nothing's gonna happen unless the, the big companies can make money and um i don't know if i've told you this before but to, um i heard um uh, holly mcquillan um who's doing a phd on sustainability basically and weaving and and making sustainable products um she said she went to a factory to um to offer help she said that she could organize the lay of the patterns onto the um piles of fabric in a certain in a different way that in a, in a way that would save them 20 percent of fabric so it would save them a cost of 20 percent of fabric if, if they wanted her to do it 
she said but the only thing you'd have to do is do you need one more seam on each garment and then but you would save 20 percent fabric so they tried it out and then they didn't stick with it because they said the one more seam on each garment actually costs more than the 20 percent of fabric so then you start to think well why is the fabric so cheap why is the fabric so cheap that it's like you know one seam was about five cents or something so it's like the fabric is so cheap you know and if the, everything is so cheap it's so easy to waste it's like you might as well throw it away they'd rather throw that away than pay for five cents a, a seam for an extra seam on each garment so really it's all about money isn't it it's all about money and wasn't it was it burberry who threw away a lot of stuff they threw away a lot of their um collections um because they'd rather throw it away than give it away to people because if they gave it away it would devalue it with people anybody wearing it so they needed to just throw it away they burnt it all rather than give it to people um just to keep the the name high up so how can we reduce the environmental impact on fashion textile sources the fibers the materials we use um I know that some of you do look at recycling. That's obviously the best, really good as well, using recycled fabrics and um, charity shop finds. Um, how we make our clothes, designed to have lower impact on waste. So we can make, can we, how can we, sorry, the how clothing can be designed to have lower impact on waste. So that could be coming, that could bring in zero waste pattern cutting and, um, you know, also things like adaptable clothing so that it can be worn um, in many ways. Uh, we've got here, what use? The customers care for their clothing and patterns of, cons of consumption. So how do they buy? Do they buy something and then just throw it away? Or can they buy something that is really going to last them a long time? Then it's got more emotional durability about it. So, you know, and also, making clothing that lasts so that it's, it can be upcycled and it can be, you know, um, it can be recycled last and disposed properly. And we were talking about, there was somebody talking about um, making clothing with uh, biodegradable, biodegradable fabrics with seeds in the lining, in the hands, so that when you finished it, you can just bury it and then it's fab. It's just there, it just goes back to the earth. Um, so there's a lot of new ideas coming out here. I mean, also clothing that can have massive, great big seams in the back of it so that it can be let out and let in again. Things that are made um, with much more care and much more um, sort of craft, lower crafts, like craft skill, slow fashion, stuff that's really meant to last. Um, I'm thinking like the Savile Row tailoring, that sort of thing. Things that are beautiful and are meant to, of special not just quick throwaway stuff so um designed for durability and longevity so that things are going to last a long time adaptability and versatility for reuse repair and restyle and raw materials and textiles color colors as well the dyes and the finishings um, change is emerging slow fashion and lifetime guarantee um lifetime guarantee recycle schemes are are around now and they are they're very small there's lots of them, very small companies working uh building up which is nice to see so just a few examples now this is andrew bannister bailey from leeds university who's made shorts out of two four square no two squares two rectangles actually so each one of those is a rectangle folded in half to make a square so very easy, very Max Tilk inspired shorts. So this Boudicca Wode, um, think of using, using um, scraps of fabric, using leftovers, using all sorts of fabrics to build up uh, designs through and not bothering about how the shape, you know, the silhouette is what it is, depending on what fabrics used. A little bit of something that looks like it might be going in might be high streety there looks a little bit um a little bit um geometric there in in make that one at the side not the other two so much actually but something that could look could be high street i don't see why high street can't take it on a little bit so izzy miyaki you need to look back at izzy miyaki for definite 
And you see the trousers there, those stripy trousers are really max tilt. I mean, they're just literally two rectangles and a, a rectangle in the middle, huge, huge trousers. So, um, and, and also the yellow one, it looks like it's just a big rectangle with two sleeves in, and the sleeves could be two rectangles as well. Um, so these are, you know, these have been, you know, this, this method of working has been around, you know, it's always been there. So that London's network of small independent designer brands are leading the way in building sustainable and responsible businesses. While profitability is, is possible, these designers don't aim at achieving a large scale, preferring, um, preferring to focus on growing businesses with a positive impact, sharing resources and working together as seen as key keys, seen as the key way to progress. Um, and I've said, oh yeah, no, yeah, in 2009, Christopher Rayburn was the first London-based designer to launch an upcycled collection, which is uh, really nice. There have been others since. And then now some of the big designers are jumping on the bandwagon to try and um, say, oh, we've, we've got a sustainable practice. Sustain you know, we obviously Stella McCartney's very much into it, um, but some of the others are actually doing it as well now. But I wonder how much of that is real, and whether it's just... Uh, trying to get um, publicity. Timo Rissnan is one of the sustainable designers here, uh, but he's also an academic and a, and a, a pattern cutter and um, I don't know, other, you know, he's not just a fashion designer, but this is the sort of thing that he would come up with. So this is a pyjama jacket. So this is that pyjama jacket. And it was made out of his, this was made out of his, mother, his grandmother's uh, bed sheets. And he did the pattern. He had to change the pattern in order to save the bits of embroidery on it, apparently. He liked the embroidery and he wanted to keep the embroidery. So that's why the sleeves at the top there, uh, there's one sleeve here, but the other sleeves cut in half because he needed to keep the embroidery for some reason. So there's sleeves, you've got the collar there. This is your centre back here. So it's very odd because um, that's, that notch comes up to this and this notch comes up to this pulling oh sorry oh no no don't don't restart now no don't don't go away don't want it restarting now flipping egg oh no i hope it's not doing it no it's good <laughs> so you can see how this is being pulled up here the sleeves are just like rectangles shoved in there uh this all happens at the back and folds up but I I gave this pattern to some students and they all came up with different ways of doing it. And I thought that was fantastic. So you just get a square and divide it up into sections and see what you can make from it. This is Holly McQuillan as well, Zero Waste Fashion Design. Again, this is in Bloomsbury, yeah, the Bloomsbury book, uh, Zero Waste Fashion Design. And you can see very much similar things to what we were looking at earlier, very much Max Till. Another way of working as well is to just think of um, a word like pleats or, you know, twists or layers or something. Work with one piece of fabric and see how many different ways you can work with it on the stand. So this was a studio workshop and the word was pleats. And uh, depending on what fabric you had, what, what weight of fabric, um, how many different ways can you create pleats on the stand? Um, but working in just with rectangles. Um, and and seeing what different silhouettes you could come up with. Another one here, two rectangles with smocking. Uh, that's literally just two rectangles. Um, and the smocking, the fabric manipulation, um, pulled it in and gave it some shape across the back and across the shoulders or and on the uh, wrists. So it literally, rather than it being just a great big bolero uh, a tube, it now became shaped. So that was really nice to see. Um, working with grids as well is another thing. That's um, a nice way of working. So you can see how, if you think this is the centre front and that's the centre back, you'd have to just work out how much one, one square needed to be. But then when you've done that, everything else falls into place. And the way to work that out is to think about the chest measurement and the chest or the, or the width of the garment. So if you know what the width of the garment is, you just divide that by four, obviously, two at the back, two at the front. And then that square is that square. That is then everything else continues from there. So, you know, so you've got like two of them make the sleeve or you could have one or you could have a third. 
um, you know, this could be longer if you added more on, but you go by the grid. And I thought that was quite interesting. And that's just literally the one moved over a bit. So it's quite a nice way of building up your zero waste uh, garments. And of course, just working with squares from, from one piece of fabric. And um, you can see squares, there's a rectangle there made from three squares, so it's still squares uh, for the collar. And the rest is then very body conscious patched on. However, I mean, to me, I don't, it's, it is doable. I don't like that one so much though. I prefer, oh, wait a minute, what's the other one? Yeah, I prefer, I don't know, it seems a bit, yeah. I don't know, it, it seems a bit plonked on to me, but, but it is a way of getting a bodycon thing as opposed to a, a wider silhouette. This was Alice Hoyle who looked at, um, um, this was, um, what are, um, oh, what are they called? Um, when you go to a house, the room plans, sorry, room plans in a home. So you've got your doorway and your different rooms and you know the, different, the windows and so on. And she used these, a whole load of these to design, to help her design. And she just literally slashed through the cuts, folded the cut, folded where the lines are and so on, and built up her sketchbook in a very three-dimensional way through with her little tops and little trousers. And it was all about folding. And then, um, you know, and then came up with, very sustainable uh, geometric and zero waste collection, which was lovely. Another one here is um, from a long time ago now, working with squares, cutting out all the squares, just working with a load of one big pile of squares, cutting through them and then cutting out. And then those that everything that's been cut out has been added on here. So every, so that's all just come from a pile of squares, but you've now got two samples. And then they can go onto the mini mannequin and you can play. These aren't finished designs by any means, but they are just um, techniques. Oh, here's Tom Reese back with his, uh, that was Tom Reese with his uh, squared um, outcome there. Yep. Uh, another here, Olivia Hernshaw, who went on to the Royal College of Art. She worked with circles, which isn't strictly zero waste, um, but it was playing with geometrics and, um, that was rather nice. And she also was inspired very much by uh, Max Tilke as well, but in a different way. And here we are, another one that's certainly inspired by Max Tilke, Amy Williams. She went on to the Royal College as well. These are the little Max Tilke sort of silhouettes, but what she did was she worked on top, layered different layers of see-through fabrics on top of each other. Um, and she did a lot of smocking as well, actually. Um, but a very interesting, unusual collection she came up with at the end. So we're nearly at the end now. So I don't know if you know about uh, TED's 10. It's a countdown. Uh, TED's 10 countdown is a global initiative to champion and accelerate solutions to the climate crisis, turning ideas into action. Launched globally in 2020, the goal is to build a better uh, future by cutting greenhouse gas emissions in in half by 2030 in the race to zero carbon in, into a, in the race to a zero carbon world. And you can check check out all the talks on TED Countdown if you want to, want to look that up. I have got some of them here, some of the, the actual things. So I won't go through it all, but we've got design to minimum waste, design for cyclability, design to reduce chemical impacts, Design to reduce energy and water use. Design that explores clean and better technologies. Design that looks at models from history and nature. Design for ethical production. Design to reduce the need to consume. We really need that. God. Design to uh, dematerialize and develop systems and services. Definitely need that and design activism, which is quite interesting too. So these can be found online. So if we think now, just conclude, um, um, clothing is as, as conversation starter, 
a dialogue um, of clothing design journeys. Think of it as that. Think of clothing as a con conversation. Think of it as collaboration. Um, combining design thoughts and actions towards positive change, um, sharing perspectives and design language of sustainability. So it is about, you know, the students can collaborate to share. It's much more about sharing ideas and about being, being much more responsible. It's like being a responsible designer. So use conversation and design possibilities within education and industry to make a sustainable change globally. And I think that's it. So I'm glad I did that before they started to reboot my, oh no, <laughs> some questions at the end. So if we could have, we've got um, a bit of time now, we can think about these questions maybe. So what can you do as a designer to highlight your climate change? Um, and how can we reduce the environmental impact of fashion on, and textiles? What materials and yarns could you work with? What methods of garment constructions could you adopt? And how can your collections communicate with a wider audience? So that bottom one is very much like um, the, the top one, really, because it's highlighting climate change, communication, communicating to a wider audience and highlighting things, bringing things to light. I mean, very much about getting people talking about it. I mean, and I think it really has moved, has shifted on so much in the last couple of years, actually. Um, I remember my mum thinking, saying things like, um, no, it's not really happening. That's just, you know, it's not really happening. I'm thinking, for goodness sake, you know, people sort of are in denial. But I, I don't think they are so much now. I think people are actually waking up to it, hopefully. And I think that's, just, that's it. 